What's up and welcome to another episode of the Scott and Ian show on the SBL podcast. How you doing? How you feeling? You ready to talk about some gear? <laughs> or, hey, if you clicked on this episode, get ready for a deep dive because Scott and I get nerdy about neck construction. How the neck is joined to the body of your base matters big time. And you might think, ah, oh, is it just a sustain thing? Ah, oh, is it just a feel thing? Ah, oh, is it just like an aesthetic thing? Is it a tone thing? Is it a stability thing? Yes. <laughs> it's all of those things. And it is fascinating because I've got all those bases. I have examples of all those bases. I bust them out. I play them for you. I plug them in. Scott wonders, huh? Are we hearing what we're actually thinking we're hearing? I mean, is all this just BS? Or is there some truth to this? Does this stuff hold water? You're about to find out. You are about to to find out here. Let me just tell you what's going on at SBL this week. We've got a mentor session coming up Tuesday, May 9th with Ariane Cap called a cool trick to learn this challenging double chromatic approach lick. Do you know that every Monday we do mentor sessions, live streams with a bunch of fantastic educators Ariane Cap is one of them. Todd Johnson. I do it. Michael League. Jacob Umansky from the amazing instrumental metal band Intervals does it. We have such a good time. Hang out with us on Scott's Bass Lessons. Oh, do you, do you need another reason to check it out? You haven't checked out that free 14-day trial yet? Check it out. We're doing the Spring Jump Start. It's actually in the last week of being able to do that. We have free lessons available. There's slap lessons. There's walking bass lessons. There's beginner lessons. They're absolutely free to grab. And if you decide to become a member right now, we have a $50 off a year membership promotion going right now. I think it makes it just shy of 150 bucks for a year, which for what we offer on the platform is a fantastic bargain, even if I do say so myself, which I do. That's enough of that, though. Let's get into this episode. Tell me, tell me what's up. Tell me what's up with, um, you've got a guard on your wrist. What happened? Oh, I'm a complete dick. That's what happened. <laughs> There's no what excuse. Happened? I took the kids ice skating. Yes. I took the kids ice skating and, um, you know, and I was like, I haven't been ice skating for years. Like th yeah. the last time I went, went ice skating, I was about 10 or something like that. I've only been twice in my entire life. So yeah. I got out on the ice and I'm like, Ooh, Ooh, a bit wobbly. Oh, the kids are wobbling <laughs> and stuff like that. Anyway, half an hour goes by and I'm, I basically think like I'm in sort of like, <laughs> I'm in some sort of like Canadian ice hockey team, man. I'm steaming around dude, this thing dude. like a psychopath. Blades of glory. Blades of glory. <laughs> I was trying to do skids and all that kind of stuff. Because I can actually, like, I, won't, I wouldn't say I can, well, no, I can skate okay. Like, you know, like rollerblade and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I can do that all right. Because um, I take the kids all the time. So I've, and, and I did it a lot when I was a kid. So I've got some skating chops and oh, they are yeah. transferable, right? So I'm like steaming it's, around this eye. Some no, is the operative zooming word. Zooming <laughs> You know, like, yeah, exactly. Like, kid, like the parents must have been watching me just thinking, who is this complete <laughs> dingbat? You know, like, oh, it's a dad. He's brought his kids down. He's oh, yeah. like having a better, better time than they are. Anyway, and, you know, inevitably oh. i did something and and one of the the uh, the front edge the front corner of the blade just stuck right in the ice so i did like a superman dive oh. and landed like on flat your wrist. bang on my, on my hands yeah and i didn't have any wrist guards on or anything like that so oh. when you go skating you wear wrist guards but for whatever Supposed reason to. ice skating you don't like oh, oh they, right. they did, yeah they didn't give us any like Dude. when i'm doing roller skating they give me it but yeah like somehow the ice is uh, more forgiving, but it isn't. Yeah, it's like, well, it doesn't hurt that much. Yeah, it's, let me tell you, it it's freaking just hurt. A bit of water. Yeah, a bit of water. A bit of, yeah. a bit of water. And I, All right. And I yeah. hit the ice. And yeah, and it's just ever since then, it's sort of like. And the funny thing is, as well, I didn't even. I'm, I've done this before. I'll sort of like do something and then like. A, you know, like several weeks, maybe four weeks, eight weeks, even longer afterwards, I'll be like. 
oh, this thing's, my knee's really hurting or whatever. And it'll, and I'll be like, oh, it was this time, like months ago. So this happened sort of like, I don't know, like two months ago or something like that. At, li- at least six weeks ago, Oh, I think. really? I thought it just happened. This, no, is, this is old. Th- this has been ago. waiting. This injury this has, been has been waiting, waiting to crop yeah. up. Yeah, exactly that. So, oh. and then I was like, oh, what is this? And it was like really hurting and it was just like all the time waking up in the night and it was aching and oh, shit wow. like that. Yeah, like bad. And then I was like, oh, it's the ice skating disaster. It's wow. the incident. Yeah. Do, you, <sighs> didn't, you didn't break it, did you, by chance? No, I don't think so. Don't think so. I haven't had it looked at. <laughs> There's like a particular God. spot, like right on the top of it. It's really sore. Ultimately, yeah. I need to go to a doctor and get him to check it, check it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I'm not should. sure. Yeah, I'm not sure about you, but I am the uh, the epitome of the man who never goes to the doctor. Like, yeah, l- yeah. things can be falling off me. Yes. I never go. The last time I went to the doctor was maybe over ten years ago. Oh my God. Are you serious? Think, yeah. Hey, listen, I also <laughs> feel that same way. I feel that same way. I don't like going to the doctor. I haven't been maybe for a year or two, but you got to cut that shit out. You got to go. I know. Yeah. I know. yeah. <laughs> well, I see if I go to the physio. I think we can go to the physio, get them to stick some gel on it, do put <laughs> some do gel it. in it. Yeah, just, you know, just put a bit of cream on it. <laughs> put a bit of cream on it, stick some needles in it, do a bit of a, what's that sort of like acupuncture? Acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll solve it for you. <laughs> yeah it'll just so take gonna, it right as rain yeah, yeah, i'm just we'll saying see. you got to get to that doc because you know you got you got to make sure everything's cool everything's cool nothing's bubbling below the surface yeah like it feels okay i can still play actually there's no pain or anything like in my fingers and stuff like that but i do want to get it done because i've got this album coming up and i don't want it sort of like flaring up or something weird going on when i'm recording this album that would yes. be not not cool i'd be really pissed off myself if that happened so yeah I'm gonna yeah, do my best to that. try and take it seriously. We, are we talking? Are we talking F bases for the record? Are we talking F base and Ibanez for the record? Are we talk? What are we talking? Well, <laughs> it's 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 a confu it's a confusing land at the minute. Yeah, I know. I've been playing a lot of the tracks on the Willis fretless. Yes, but. I have been checking out a fretless F bass as well that mm. is for sale in London. That is so, and just to be completely transparent, I just, I love that Willis bass. Yes. But I also don't, <laughs> you know, what yes. it's like, I'm like, ooh, he's got the Gary Willis signature bass. Ooh, he's well, a Gary Willis fanboy. And well, I am yes. a Gary Willis fanboy. <laughs> yeah, right, but right. I'm not sure. I, I would love it to be my own thing right yeah i that's agree the, yeah that's yeah. the thing right and there's something too about like you're playing with a bunch of guys that have played with willis exactly <laughs> so it's like scott kinsey on keys and yeah. gurgo and they'll be like oh little willis like willis has had a little a little love child you know it's so, lil lil willis l-i-l apostrophe yeah. lil willis yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'll go in. I'll have my mountain biking. Oh, you don't biking. want to be little I'll Willis. I'll be wearing my mountain biking gear, and I wear my cap and sort of like you know I'm, Nike hat. Maybe I should just yeah. lean really into it. <laughs> <laughs> just full on, just like like cranked down, like Nike hat, and exactly tucked in. I mean, man, I remember his vibe, dude. His vibe was impeccable. Yeah, in like uh, those first that the instructional DVD. Or I guess it was VHS. Oh, yeah, where he's that playing that sort of like dude. silver bass. Oh. Yeah, and it's like tucked into jeans. I feel like kind of maybe stone washed oh, jeans, yeah, stone dude. Washed. He had a vibe going on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah he had a yeah. vibe, man. It was like <laughs> it was normcore before normcore was that. You yeah. know, it was like it was like like hip dad vibes, man. Dude, I, he would be I, super I hip right thinking now. That. that what he yeah. was wearing, that would be like super like the the cap. The way the the shape of it is actually like really yes. in right now. The, the shirt, dad hat they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, the shirt super. I'm not sure he'd have it tucked in, but and, and the jeans <laughs> like basically yeah. it's come back around. The whole thing. The whole thing's yeah. come back around. We're just old enough to have seen it come back around. You know, like I feel like multiple times yeah. almost. If anybody wants <laughs> to check like, oh, this out, that. just go to YouTube and write in. Um, 
Is it Gary Willis Modern, modern Electric Bass? Modern Electric I think so. Bass. Yeah. It is. The playing in that is outlandish. It is, it is outlandish. Maybe, I think, that is it self-defense might be the coolest bass performance I've ever seen in my life. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh, what? I, I fell in love with Gary's thing, man. And like his, he has this incredible combo of like Jocko, Rocco, Prestia, like 16th note thing, but it's almost more, it hit me more like electronic in a way. Like it hit me more like less funk yeah. and more kind of like angular, and, uh, and then there was aspects of his playing that reminded me like a little bit even of Mick Karn. Like it was just yeah. obtuse enough for me like, as kind of a rock guy to pay attention. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, really listening yeah. to a lot of jazz bass players coming up. But Gary felt meaner in a really cool way. Like he felt like more dangerous or something. Yeah, like dude. his playing just felt like teethy. Well, it, well, and, yeah, he's got actually, I think when he plays down low, it had sort of like a real synth feel to it yeah, you know like the attack of yes. the note especially like on self-defense a great example of that like when he he's playing some stuff down low, even his solo lines and they sound really there's something kind of synth like about them but he yeah. is like more groove based than you know like there's there's something re you can tell that he has sort of like a deep uh respect and love for groove based music like the you know yeah. like uh Paul Jackson and you know with with the headhunters and with Rocco and he, he definitely comes from that school of player yeah. but he's got this of I was gonna say this extra gear. I think he's got about a hundred extra gears I know, than yeah, most of the bass players. Gears. There's a lot of gears there. But yeah, but that that video, man, I used to take it around to all my friends' house, you know, houses. They used to be into like, oh, dude, <laughs> That's right. yeah. I, they I used remember to watch you saying yeah, that. Yeah, we'd be watching like Smashing Pumpkins and oh, we'd be watching no. Foo Fires. And then when nobody was, <laughs> nobody was watching, I'd like slip in the, the Willis DVD or the Willis VHS oh. and get self defense on. And like, I can remember them, like, oh. I was so oblivious at the time. They must, they must have been like, is this guy smoking crack or what? Like, what is this? <laughs> it was like crazy. But man, it was so oh, I cool. I love that you did that. It was awesome. I love that you did that. I, that is true love, man. Yeah. That is true dedication to be like, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like remove the music of today, like of the the pop music of today, and you, we are gonna check out some tribal tech right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is great. Yeah. That is great. I love it. Was I was completely Incredible. oblivious to it as well. I, I honestly just thought, God, these guys must be loving this, and they must have just been like, <laughs> What are you talking about? Oh, Oh, that is great. Did, were they nice to you? Did they like let it play? Or were they trying to get into it? Um, they were. I was. If I had to take a random guess, like I was great on guitar when I was a kid, you know, <laughs> listen to me. Yeah. I was great. But I was. I was good, you know, when great. I was sort of like, yeah. when I was yes. hanging out with them kids, I was 16 and I was like rocking the Vi solos and stuff like that. My, they respected my you. point is, yeah, they thought yeah. I was a badass. And right. me turning up with these you know willis videos they must you have just been like them. they must have just been like like i don't think they they would have been like oh this is crap they would have just thought oh this is obviously what he's getting into to expand as a musician right. and stuff like that they were cool they, oh, were, they cool. were cool guys yeah they were cool oh, that's guys. so cool <laughs> yeah. yeah like uh i feel like i had that same kind of thing with my friends in high school but then when i went to college and i was like hey guys check out like under the table and drumming like you know oh like, yeah oh, Beaufort, bass players yeah, we, we gotta check out the carter beaufort drumming yeah you know people were like no way like i got teased mercilessly for the things that i liked is that what the one with victor in it is victor Wooten in it no, that's, that's like a uh, that's a different one. This is this is him just playing drums. I don't even know if if there's a bass player in it. There might be. It's him playing along with I the. I remember um, buying that. Yeah, it's him playing along with the he's Dave playing. Matthews tracks, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And killing yeah, it. Yeah, killing it. Oh, just killing it. He's I got mean, his gloves on. A, he's got his. Thing. He's got his like <laughs> yeah, colorful yeah. top on. It's like tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's tight. <laughs> so tight. Yeah, yeah tight. Yeah. That jersey kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know what I've been thinking about recently? Like, obviously, like, we're doing this album, like, Simon and I, and Simon King, if anybody doesn't know, Simon King he wrote all the tracks of the album. So we're recording this album with uh, Scott Kinsey and uh, Gergo and Dave Binney and stuff. Anyway, so, and it's, it's like, it's 
unashamedly fusion. It is fuse like hardcore fusion yeah, from sure is. right from like tribal tech and chick Korea and and that kind of um era of music was really 80s through the 90s that's when it was really his heyday heyday and it kind of sort of like phased out around 2000 there were yeah. still great players you know great fusion players but they were they were i guess sort of like approaching composition in a slightly different way it was definitely m- less orchestrated like the people that yes. jump to mind are like Matt, Matt Garrison, Yannick Guzdala, Hadrian Faro, uh, Tony Gray did some really fantastic albums. It was definitely less angular, less, you know, orchestrated. It was kind of like more kind of song based stuff, but with like blazing and song and groove based stuff with blazing bass playing. Uh, whereas the the early 80s and stuff in the 90s were definitely there was a lot of stabs man <laughs> there's a lot of stabs there's like a lot of unison lines right. a lot of unison lines <laughs> so so my point is that with it like i've kind of been thinking about because we're doing a video we're doing all we're recording all of it live so we're going to play yep. all of it live in the studio and we're going to record it all we're going to film it all kind of like snarky puppy style you know, yeah. like they did, where it's beautifully, beautifully shot and stuff like that. And we've done that stuff before with, like, the stuff that I did with uh, Gary Novak and uh, Josh Smith was that was shot really well. Um, but I, I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be cool the way that John Mayer, do you remember when he released that album that was like a throwback to the eighties, and he had all of his oh. bands sort of like an eighties oh, vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's yeah, the right. thing, like, there's not that many. It, I can't figure out. I was like, part of me was like, wouldn't it be cool if there was like some kind of, if it was obvious, like it was obvious with John Mayer, like he was doing sort of like an 80s style, early 90s style record. It was, it was obvious because of the aesthetic of the video, but I'm not sure how to make the aesthetic of the the video. (laughs) Obviously sort of like, you know, throwback to the 80s and 90s without dressing in stonewashed jeans and wearing shirts tucked in, which I don't want to do. I I, I wondered if there was some other hat tip. What's the hat tip to the 80s and 90s in terms of video aesthetic? What's the hat tip? I mean, it could be things in the background. It could be like a, a row of VHS tapes that are sort of subtly placed, you know, you know, in the in the shelves of the studio behind. It could be memorabilia based. I, I do love, though, this idea that like everybody walks in the studio, you know, Nate from Snarky Puppy, Scott from Tribal Tech, you know, Gergo. And, and you have wardrobe like on a clothing <laughs> rack. And you're like, all right, guys, it's hyper color T-shirts, yes. you know, that are going to get like change colors in the places you sweat like such yeah. a terrible what that was such a terrible but amazing idea Dude, some and people then like won't you know there's stonewash jeans about. yeah what were they called those <laughs> yeah. what were they called hypercolor, hypercolor at least yeah. over here yeah hypercolor it was like a company that made this clothing that it would change colors based on your body heat so you know you'd be wearing a blue shirt and then you'd sweat a little and your armpits would turn orange yeah it was you know? <laughs> awesome and terrible all at the same time <laughs> You're gonna make somebody wear zubas. Did you guys have zubas? Uh, Those are no. pants that were like big, puffy, kind of like balloony looking, like MC Hammer pants. Oh, they had like we did tiger have stripes them. on them and we stuff. We did not really? have them. We That's just had you guys are cool. like tight jeans, really, really See, tight the jeans shit, in though. the nineties. Yeah, we went, we went way. Did you guys ever have like big, big, baggy stuff Huge, that happened in the like late nineties? Yeah, okay, bag. Yeah, 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 jeans. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but you didn't do the Zubas, so there was no, like, uh, parachute MC Hammer pant vibe. The, not that I knew about. Not that I knew yeah. about. I'm just, I'm looking at um, the, uh, there's a, a great video of, I'm going to just mute this. There's a great video of the Omar Hakim band uh, yeah. with Victor Bailey playing bass. And that was, let me just see if I can see when this was actually filmed. It was definitely, like, early 90s, I think. But damn, it was awesome. Check check this out. Oh, hang on. I'm trying to get the... Why, because of the sound or because of the clothing choices? Well, actually, I'm looking at the clothing choices and the video choices now. <laughs> but the track's <laughs> awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Omar Hakim. Oh, he's such a monster. Can you hear that okay? Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Do like the keyboard marimba sound. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> it just screams this era. Yeah. So Victor is wearing a... Oh, yeah. Got a blazer on. Hell yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. What a great player. Oh, they sound great. Yeah, they sound great. I don't know, dude. What is it? Is it like you got a box of Teddy Grahams that you're snacking on? I don't know, man. I don't know if you guys had those over there. Like, I'm just going to put what, it what out. It? I'm going to point out, as I'm watching this video, I've just realized that this idea of a hat tip to, to the late 80s and the <laughs> early 90s is crap. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's, it, I think it might be a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Although I do think you can have something subtle. I think you, I, you got to sneak in the Willis VHS you know, in a in a studio shelf, as the you know, as the camera's panning by, I could do that. It's just a little sneaky tip, yeah. But don't make those guys wear hypercolor t shirts and no, zubas. No, and, and will hate no you. blazers. Did you guys call them blazers? <laughs> yeah, we call it like like a jacket, sort of like a sports jacket kind of vibe. Yeah, I don't think we call them Is sports I... jackets over here. That sports jacket thing really always. I was like, do people play sports in these? Like, uh, yeah, I yeah. don't know why it would. I don't know why we call it that. But yeah, blazer. It's we a call blazer. Blazer a blazer. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember yeah. my mum saying that I needed to get a blazer for a wedding. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's cool. The one thing that still baffles me is vest. Like, because for us, vest means something that is fancy that you're going to put on. It, it's like the, the second layer in a tuxedo where oh. you've got the dress shirt, you've got a vest that goes over that buttons, right? Yeah. And then you've got the jacket, the, the sports, the, so, the uh, so a vest sports vest. Is a waistcoat. The, well, <laughs> the vest is the waistcoat. Yes, dude. Waistcoat. The waistcoat, yeah. We definitely don't say that over here. Waistcoat. Yes. And you guys say vest for like, uh, we call them wife beaters, which <laughs> that's terrible. But what we, is we, the, pro- what is pro- the pro- official no one name calls that. What's the official name of a wife? That is, official- I feel guilty even <laughs> saying that term. I know. Like, I, I regret that it came out of my mouth. It's probably not cool to say anymore. I'm probably just now going to get canceled. But yes, <laughs> that's what everyone used to call those. Uh, what else would you call that? A sleeveless tee, a tank top, dude. A tank top. Are you sure? A tank no. top US. Yeah, okay. put in tank top. Oh, yeah. That's a vest, Tank right? Top. See? Yeah. And you guys call that vest. And do you know, whenever someone said, oh, just wearing my vest, like when you're like, oh, yeah, I should do it just wearing my vest, I thought, oh, interesting, like just wearing like a waistcoat? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's the look. Maybe that's my look. <laughs> dude, that's it. Just that's the that's the hat tip. I'd have to go and do some freaking pumping in the gym, dude. I'm, I'm you know, like it's, it's waistcoats if, for if everyone. If you're wearing just a waistcoat, oh. there needs to be some substance behind can, it. There ain't no substance in the minute. Dude, it's just. Can yeah. you imagine handing Gergo Borlai a waistcoat and saying, "Mate, like this? This is, is it. The vibe. This is the." Vibe. And he's like, "Oh, he's like, great. Like what under it?" And you're like birthday suit yeah, under nothing. it. I'll like, tell you what, nothing, man. Dude. There's some talking about great, like, just, you know, seeing what people used to wear, like, years ago, and yeah. just, yeah, seeing them react to it. I'm a huge fan of Gary Husband, um, the drummer Gary yeah, Husband. He's actually from Leeds, yeah. but doesn't live in Leeds anymore. He's, like, obviously played with Alan Holdsworth and Level 42 yeah. and, like, all of these, and, and he's an incredible artist in his own right. But when he played... In the late 80s and early 90s, when he played with Alan Holsworth, he used to play in Speedos. Are you serious? And that's it. Just Speedos. Just just a tiny pair of shorts. Just Oh, not shorts, dude. Do you know what Speedos are? (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. A tiny pair of under underwear esque uh bathing suit. Yes. Yeah. He that's what he used to wear. Just and I commit, just that? Just that. Nothing on top? Yeah. He actually commented it a few weeks ago. There was a picture of him on his Instagram, and he was like, I cannot believe that I used to go on stage like this. That is incredible. Yeah. Maybe the that's the look. Too. Maybe that's the look. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine telling Nate Worth? Yeah. Just, 
you know, if, if you feel a little insecure, just hide behind that big percussion rack of stuff you got. His, his it's going to be all good, dude. Fizzy pants. Where are these? <laughs> Where's your <laughs> pants? Oh, all the clothing things just mean different things. I know. It's yeah, that took me a that? long time, too. Do you know, finally, when I got the vest reference was when I watched Toast of London, which is a BBC4 show That's that when you I got love. It. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. And he, he was saying he was going to do something in his vest. And then he had an undershirt, a tank top on. Yeah. And I was like, that's a vest. <laughs> it, I, that was like two years ago. Like it was not, you know, not long. Here we are. Yeah. We're making a difference in Here the world. Are. You and I, you know, we're clearing up the confusion. <laughs> Listen, listen, it's important. These are the hard hitting issues, dude. Exactly. You can go that. to other podcasts to you can go to other podcasts to listen to, you know, world news and heavy things, but Scott and I are tackling the real issues. The real shit. British versus American slang, the hard hitting issues, dude. Look what hard I've got. Hitting. Look what I've got here. If you if you listen to the podcast, if you're listening to it on iTunes, just to put it out there, that we have the podcast on YouTube as well. So you can we do, actually we do. watch it and you can see us like looking into each other's eyes. But, <laughs> but, and also we sometimes play basses and hold basses up like this. Oh my God. Yeah. Look at that thing. We hold basses up like this. So if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, just go to Scott's Bass Lessons podcast on YouTube. You'll find it and make sure you subscribe because that means when we release another one, you're going to get notified and all that cool stuff. The reason I pulled this up though <laughs> is because yeah? somebody I know, yeah, Ian, <laughs> has got another, like a, well, basically a, another version of this, which is a Ken Smith yeah. 80s four string. When's this yes. one? Do you know when this one? I'm, I'm asking you about my bass. I can't remember. Let me have a look. Let me find out. When, yours, I think yours? yours is earlier. I thought yours was an 84, and this one is an 85. Oh, God. As if as if we haven't, you know, mimicked each other enough. Like, now I buy a friggin' four-string Ken Smith. Just puke. But I love it, dude. I love it. Exactly. It, this, this thing is so cool. And when I played yours over in Leeds, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, this is pretty great. Especially the early ones. I'm sure the ones that they make now are great. But the early ones have that Vinnie Fodera connection. Yeah. Right? Was that made by talking, Yeah. Well, I think it's the era. I don't know if it was made, but it has this neck joint. And I posted this on Instagram and, um, you know, when Vinny was making these, they took this neck joint idea from like a repaired upright bass. And it was what the early version of the Fodera dovetail joint, Got right, it. where yeah. you're combining a center wood and the neck. So it's not neck through in that there isn't a block of neck wood that goes all the way through, but it's not bolted on and it's not glued on. It's jointed. It's like woodworked on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's wood work. I, I said that. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's combined into this center wood. And is yours the same? Same. So I've just pulled up the yeah. I was just checking online actually. Mine's a nineteen eighty four. Four. Yep, yeah, okay. Yeah, when's yours eighty six? Yeah. Eighty five. Oh eighty five. So it might have been made yep. by Vinny. It looks yeah. like the neck joint is. Yep. Yep. In fact, there are a couple of people, Jordan Cortese from Aguilar, shout out to Jordan. He was like, ah, that's a Vinny base. I know it. And there are a couple other people too. That because were like, oh, of yeah, the yeah, neck yeah. joint. Yeah. Because of the neck joint. Mitch too at, uh, at Alinto. He was like, oh yeah, that's a Vinny base for sure. Um, there are a few people that have, that have said that. Oh, and also, um, uh, and also Will DeYoung. Oh, yeah, because he who, used to work for was the for shop Fidera, manager right? there, yeah, and now he's at Spectre. Uh, but, man, what an amazing, amazing instrument. So, you know, if, if we're talking today about neck construction, <laughs> like, like, like you clicked on this expecting a deep dive into neck construction. Oh, and we're going to give it to you. <laughs> we are going to give it to you. A little out of order, I suppose, but... This is a very interesting take on how to join a neck to a body. This is not typical, but it's very beautiful. What's it called? It's a dovetail, so cool. is it? Is it a dovetail? dovetail. This is the yeah. early dovetail joint. And now the, the Foderas, Foderas are made with a different looking dovetail joint, but I believe the idea is similar where, you know, you do this interlocking pattern in the woods, right? And then I'm sure it is glued. Yeah. But it isn't it isn't one block set into another block with glue like a Gibson that I'll show you. Yeah. And I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. I think that's the essence of it. Yeah. Is that there's no bolts and it isn't one block glued to another block. It's locked in 
like, you know, if you think of a dovetail joint of how, you know, like cabinets are joined, I think that's the idea, the principle that's going on with these early Smiths. Yeah. Very, and it, I, I guess cool. that this will be just to put it out there as well, that all of the different, um, if you're new to, I guess, sort of learning about base construction, the different, uh, necks and specifically neck joints do have an effect on the sound so they do yeah and on how they feel too like how they how they resonate in your hands yes right yeah for sure for sure what what would you characterize that difference to be what the the actual the way that it feels in my hands or the actual tone yeah like between something that is like a dovetail or a neck through which we'll show you in a bit too versus the classic like fender bolt-on yeah so there's like should we talk about the different types right so there's the bolt-on which yep. is i'm gonna hold one up so everybody can see i'll it. hold one up too yeah so this is a bolt-on neck and then we'll talk about the sounds of them so this is a bolt-on neck where the neck is bolted onto the body and this was popularized by leo fender that's how he yeah. he made the uh, the old p bases and the j bases they were all bolt-ons um, and, and Scott's there holding an F base that has bolts that are just going straight through the body wood of the banana base. The banana it's very base yellow. It is very yellow. Yep. <laughs> so it's four bolts that are asymmetrical into a neck block, into the heel of the neck that's holding the uh, neck in. And I love that you have that one. That's a particular vibe. The one that I have here is a Vorin Saku base. Um, Yours that has got is like more a neck classic, plate on it, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is that classic fender thing, right? Where there's a neck plate where the bolts go in. Let me see if I can get it closer without the shine on it. There we go. Uh, difficult but yeah where you've got this plate that's bolted on the bolts go through the plate through the body into the neck and i also wanted to show this because this neck plate was hand in, uh, engraved by paula at vorinsaku who is just so awesome she does all these amazing hand engravings and it's just beautiful and i love that this classic design but it's cool that you have that one there too because that's more of like a modern sort of sleek there's no plate right it's just yeah the, the bolts are recessed so you don't feel the plate yeah you don't so, feel so the check bolts this, before we get yeah. on to sort of like the sound of them what what's yeah what's the sort of like the bonus in terms of uh feel between let's say a uh, a base with a plate like yours more traditional yep. and one like this what's the what are the benefits of having something without a plate for instance well i mean i feel like i feel like you want to answer that right is isn't it's about when your hand goes up into the high register you don't feel the block Right. So exactly. like on this yeah. base, I've got this big block where because this is more like fender style, your hand encounters this. But I have never not liked that just because that's what I know. Yeah, me but neither. it is a thing. Right. It's like it's a thing. And so modern, you know, more like modern style bases aimed to remove that block so that your hand could glide all the way up to the 24th fret yeah. or the 22nd <laughs> fret. I don't know. Right. 22nd like, on that one. High. Yeah. OK, yeah. 22nd. Yeah. Right. And you have access all the way up and you're not encountering that block. Yeah. But I will say just for me, the block is almost almost like a comfort zone. I like feeling it. I rest my thumb on it when I'm up high. Like to me, the block feels great because it's just the thing that I kind of grew up with, with, you know, Got it. sort of, I guess, vintage style. Instruments. It's interesting yeah. when you How look, you? when you look at the F base, there's no block there at all. Is there? So there's, exactly. there's no right. plate and there's no block. So, mm -hmm. because there's two different things, right? There's, there's the block and then there's the plate. So the F base doesn't have any plate. It doesn't have any block. But I have got a base I'm going to grab over here in a minute that has a block, but no plate. Check oh it out. Oh my God. Oh, yeah, a third in, version? A block and no plate? <laughs> a block? Yeah. Yeah, a block with no plate. So again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And again, if you're not checking out the podcasts on YouTube, all you need to do is go to YouTube, right? Scott's Bass Lessons Podcast, and you'll find us. So there is a base with a block but no plate. Yes. It's an Ibanez. Um, and, and the reason and, – and I, and I kind of guess that there's – the reason that this hasn't got a plate is, to Ian's point earlier, they've been able to round it all off. 
So when you've got a plate on the back, in general, you're going to the edges of the block are going to have 90 degree angles. So you've got yeah. that block to kind of like pin it into and it sits flat. Whereas this Ibanez base, they've gone with the block still. So just kind of like very similar to a, a fender bolt on, but they haven't used a plate and that's given them the ability to round it all off. So when you're playing yes. it, when you go up high, and I'm, right now I'm up to the sort of like the 18, 19, 20, like right up there, right yeah. up towards the 24th fret, I haven't got, there's nothing really in the way of my hand. I can feel the block, but it's not a big, it's got a, not a big deal. And if I grab the F base, let me just sort of like side by side comparison this for you. If I grab the F, F base, yeah, like, there's definitely a difference, but it's not huge. Like it doesn't sure. yeah. annoy me when I can feel the block. Yeah. But if I was here, just to put it out there, if I was like playing lots of, if I was playing, so for instance, this album I'm doing right now, if I was trying to do that on a traditional jazz bass style instrument with a block, yes, then it would be getting in my way. It definitely you notice would. It. It, it for sure because it's like there's loads of melody stuff that's really up high, so being kind of free, really up high, is is definitely an advantage for that style of music for sure. Right. So yeah, and this is also like it really speaks to aesthetics, right? Because yeah. you know the instrument that I'm holding here, this Vorinsaku, is very like Fender inspired, very like classic car vibes. The block is part of that thing. The plate is part of that thing. And typically, when you're drawn to something like this. You're may you maybe didn't spend a lot of time listening to Gary Willis and Tribal Tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And so the players that are really needing that access into the upper register to, to jazz bro shred, which uh, I love, but I just can't do very well, then you may want to choose an instrument that uh, has more access up there. Um, yeah. can, before we move on to something else, Scott, can we talk about the sound characteristic of, of like what people talk about with bolt on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm just making notes here as well, so we can we can just sort of like go over this as we're as we're going through it, and just to sort Love of it. like yeah, before we just get onto the sound of the bolt on, um, if you, if you're if you're taking notes as we're going through this, basically there's <laughs> three... nobody's taking notes. Oh, dude. Maybe somebody Some is. Nerdies. Are you taking notes out somebody there? Somebody as nerdy as I am is. If they're as nerdy as I am, they are. <laughs> so there's basically three different types of bolt-on. Yeah. There's a traditional fender style with a block and a plate. You got it. There's the less traditional style that still has a block but no plate and he's generally rounded yep. off. So feels a little smoother in the hand and you can get up to those higher, higher frets a little easier. And then you've got the bases like the F base, for instance, where there is basically no block. It's bolt on still, but no block. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and in that version to, well, there, there's going to be people that will say, well, but there's, of course, this people use separated plates. I mean, I remember Yamaha using, you know, two different plates that connected the screws, but not a plate for the whole thing. I mean, there's variations of this, but I agree. Those are the main three. Yeah. Those are definitely the main three. The Billy Sheehan base has a uh, interesting yeah, the bolts are like maybe at an angle that pull the neck into exactly. the pocket yeah, yes. or something. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to find <laughs> yeah. a picture of it at the minute, but I can't find any of the back. Oh, here it Rock is. Rock solid neck joint. Okay, yeah. So the Billy Sheehan, um, the Billy Sheehan signature base, the Yamaha, the newest model that he's doing anyway, has got the neck is goes really far into the body. So it's a bolt on, yeah. but it goes really far into the body. That's the uh, that's one of the differences. Um, and Overwater actually do the same there. Some of their bolt-ons go really, like, really far into the body and you, because you're trying to get vibration transfer. You're trying to get the actual, sure. which is when we were talking earlier, you said when you've got like a neck through or a bolt-on or um, a glued neck, which we'll talk about, like they feel different in the hands from a resonance perspective because some of them, you know, transfer the vibration in different ways. Now, I will right. say that this isn't all down to neck joint. It also, it is not. it's like a mix. When you're making a bass oh. or when you're buying a bass, it's it's the 
it's the the mix of all of the different elements that really come into play so it's the body wood the neck wood etc cetera, etc cetera. but fingerboard wood but part of it is the neck joint so just to take it back to the uh the billy sheen base it's actually a three bolt neck so it's very if you, if you guys check this out on the internet um put the Billy Sheehan bass bolt on or B- Billy uh, Billy Sheehan attitude bass bolt on um, and you'll see on the back it's got three bolts so it's actually very similar to the F bass in that way it hasn't got a block they've got rid of the block completely it's got three yep. bolts no plate no block and then it's got two screws way 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 far down into the body that actually go into the neck at a 45 degree angle that's to right. pull yep. the neck hard into the body so you're getting better transfer of energy and vibration so yeah and when billy was playing you know all that talus mr big especially in mr big he's bending the neck and he's doing all this stuff you know and i mean he was really hard on his instruments and so he wanted something that would uh yeah that would really stand up on the road and feel really great and and I have regret about selling my first Billy Sheehan bass. It was my first real bass, Scott. My grandma, my grandma helped me buy it, and I <laughs> Gutted. sold it. Got <laughs> it. Just feel stupid for doing that. What color was it? Uh, it was the it was the original ver- limited edition one. It was lightning blue. It was, it the, was blue the blue one, one that had the pink with the perloid perloid guard. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it was just a straight oh, white guard. White? Yeah, it was It was called Lightning Blue, and it had pink inlays, and the neck had a... This was so hip. The neck had a slight pink tint to the, to the lacquer, so in certain lights, the neck looked a little bit pink. It was so badass. It was the limited one, yeah, with the woofer pickup and the epoxy-covered DiMarzio and the two outputs and the whole deal. And it had a hip shot on it, and it had scalloped frets. Yeah, dude, scalloped frets. It had scalloped frets up high. And I, the crazy thing about that instrument is it was so Billy. And I had a bass teacher that was really into Billy Sheehan. But I wasn't that into into Billy Sheehan. Like, I mean, I liked it, but I, it was so, it was really headstock heavy and it always just felt kind of unwieldy, had a giant P bass neck yeah. on it. And I kind of wanted an Ibanez, like I kind of wanted to move in like the, uh, Gary Willis direction or like a Spectre direction or something like a little more nimble. Yeah, yeah. This thing was just this tugboat of like a hair metal bass. And I, yeah, I remember never actually getting along with it. I'm looking at, I'm I mean, looking at them now. I've got them up on reverb. I'm sort of like geeking out yeah, on the Yamaha oh God, the Yamaha Attitude Billy Sheen signature bass. But dude, I've sat next to Billy and played his bass. This is the outlandish thing. It is yep. the action is not low. It is no, not right. low. He just plays it like a complete monster. Like he's just he's a, a like, freaking uh, alien. Yeah. Like I yeah, imagine that his bass was just gonna have this incredibly low setup to let him and allow him to do all of the outlandish things that he does on the bass, but it wasn't like that at all. He obviously just plays right. it really hard and just has a frightening technique. But to to what yeah. to your point or your question, what does it sound like? Well, out of the three main different types of neck joint the bolt on the glued and the neck through the bolt on has the punchiest sound that's to Mm, to, mm. and i've had people luthiers specifically give me the the full lowdown is because there's frequencies missing there's less frequencies Mm. in a bolt on neck versus a neck through or a glued in neck and the human ear fills in those missing frequencies so it sounds Mm. punchier there you go. Well, and I heard Roger Sadowski say something one time that that I was like, oh, I finally kind of get this, where the bolt-on construction interrupts, right? There's like an interruption because of it's not all yeah. sort of one glued piece. Yeah. So that what happens is you get this bump of attack. Like the, the first, the initial attack that you play is like, oh, uh, and then the tail of the note gets sort of stymied by the neck yeah. joint. So it goes like, oh, and was then it this it, conversation it, like, that we had with him? Was that last year? Was he when we were talking with Roger on Base Space? I actually don't remember if he specifically addressed this at Base Space, but I remember hearing him talk about this. I don't know, you know, in some article. Maybe in yeah, maybe magazine. I read or watched the same video or something like yeah. that because I can. Yeah, it makes sense exactly that. Yeah. 
it's it's the difference between the transient of the note and the tail. So if you've ever recorded your bass in a DAW, digital audio workstation, Pro Tools, whatever, and you play a note, there's always an initial attack and then a tail of the note. Like if you just play it without any muting. Yeah. And in a bolt-on, the idea is, and I'm sure there's tons of examples of, well, but not this bolt-on, but the general idea is that the transient, the very first initial attack of the note is bigger and then the tail is a bit smaller with a bolt on because it has to deal with this uh this neck joint but you know so you could say oh well that's bad because oh there's something that's stopping the vibration but in a way these barriers to vibration are what give the instrument its vibe Right. So when Scott uses the word punchy, that's because you hearing the transient bigger than the tail of the note. Yeah. Yeah. I've, Is that right, yeah, Scott? I, yeah. Something, something, like, something that? like that. Yeah. It basically it sounds like it cuts through more or, or is at least more punchy to the human ear because of that. The missing yeah. frequencies. Um, yeah. And and I've got this bass plugged in. Now, look, there's tons of different different bases and different things that you know that make up uh what a bolt-on sounds like but if i play this bass here let's see this to me it has that initial attack yeah you know what i mean yeah pop, 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 pop. oh yeah Now, it's a short scale bass. The strings are old. Uh, the pickups are single coils. There's a lot of things going in the vintage direction. But this instrument sound, I freaking love the sound of this bass. It's such a, it's such a character. And it's kind of like old school punchy. Yeah. And to me, this does not sound like the Spectre that I'll play later in the episode. And the next, it's very, the very different. The next three, right? Yeah, and, but I mean, you know, and, and also the Spectre has EMGs and it's active and there's a lot of things, but just the way that this thing presents its note, it goes poof, and then the, the tail drops a little bit. Now, it still has nice sustain, but that initial attack is bigger than its sustained yeah. tail. Here's a question for you. Um, yep. Of your bass playing friends... Um, maybe maybe you don't have any of these friends. <laughs> maybe I'm just friends with loads of nerdy bass players, and maybe no, the, maybe no you friends. might no, you might be friends with just sort of like cool, cooler cooler bass friends. But like I have got like a lot of nerdy <laughs> bass friends. Um, okay, yeah, we've yeah, yeah. talked a lot about neck threes and glues and you know and boltons <laughs> and stuff like that. And I will say I have got more friends who prefer mm. boltons to neck throughs. Yeah. How about you? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. Yes. Because I think it's the it's the main thing that we're also used to hearing. We're used to hearing the electric bass, like a Fender style bass or something, you know, and then tart it up, right? A Fender bass with active electronics like a Sadowski or, you know, different kind of bolt-on construction like F bass. But always still, that recipe is pretty damn hard to beat. It's pretty hard to beat. Yeah. And it's hard to like get used to and really like fall in love with a neck through like really deep when you have come up a bolt on player. And here's the thing too: bolt ons are easier to make. They're more um, they're easily more easily assembled. They're easier to work on. So that bolt ons are cheaper. The in the cheaper end of instruments. Yeah. So when you start playing, guess what you play? Nobody is starting out on a Spectre NS2. Yeah. You know, no one is starting out on a Ken Smith. Everybody starts out on a bolt-on, almost, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of get used to yeah. it. I think, I don't know, is that, do you feel like yeah, that? Yeah, when, 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 when I was a kid, I always used to just think that the neck throughs were better because they were more expensive. Exactly. I just used to think, oh, Same. they, were, yeah, they must just sound awesome because they're neck through and that's more expensive the neck throughs are always more expensive for the most part because they're yeah. they're trickier to make you know there's more uh more materials and or not more materials but there's probably more waste in wood and stuff like that because you got to get a lo yes. longer cuts of wood and so i just always thought that the neck through was going to sound better and ultimately 
uh, it turns out that that's not the case. I think that it's just, you know, some people love um, bolt-ons and some people like neck throughs and, yeah. and maybe some people like that's these right. glued necks as well. Ian's just picked up his plexiglass. I'm not sure it's plexiglass, <laughs> but some kind of see-through base. I, I just thought it would be fun to show this. So if you're watching the pod, this is a base that Jake Sarek makes. This is a Lincoln by Sarek, and it is completely made of lucite. So it's completely transparent. So you can actually see how this lovely quarter sawn roasted maple neck is attached with bolts into this base. And this is really interesting because Sarek's are very sort of vintage throwback, but check it out. No plate and not really a heel. I mean, there's a little bit of one, but it's very like integrated into the curvature heel, of that's the back of this base. We've been called them blocks. Damn, we should have been called <laughs> yeah, them heels. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's a heel. Yeah, I guess it's a heel, right? <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was cool just to be able to see how that neck is put in there, right? You can see how it, how deep it goes in. Yeah. How far? So again, if you're watching the pod, sorry to make you jump on YouTube, but it's uh, it's really cool to see how that works. Um, and then, hey, so we heard the we heard sort of the punchiness of a bolt. Can I pull up a neck through now? You want to well, move? Well, do you want to do through? glued first? Because, oh, sure, because sure, yeah, because sure. if anybody's wondering, like, what do, does a glued sound like? What does a, a neck through sound like? It's kind of like the a glued neck is somewhat in between. A bolt on, I think yeah, so. A bolt on and a a neck through. It's somewhat in between. Um, so there's more energy transfer, more vibration transfer because the actual, um, yeah. As Ian's pulling up this this Gibson here, and the, they just yeah. look incredible. Look awesome, like it's they? such a lovely way to join. Just so so it's this classic thing where the neck. Uh, is actually glued into the pocket of the body. And so there's a little bit of, you know, and then they sand around it to kind of join these, the uh, the spot where it goes in, but then they leave a little lip here on the back. Right? Yeah. That's so cool. And it's just very elegant looking. So this is a Gibson non-reverse Thunderbird, but also regular Thunderbirds are this way. And I also believe that I think Rickenbackers are set yeah, glued they're glued. As and well. the Ken Smith, that's glued. Yeah. The, the dovetail's glued, you know, like all of yes, those are glued. Slightly right. different, you know, diff right. in a different way, but still glued. Yeah. Yep. I think like that when, when you hear someone talk about a glued neck, I, I always picture this kind of style, this like old school design of a Gibson Thunderbird or something. And you'll also hear it referred to as set yeah. neck. So like set and glued are sort of synonymous. Is that right? Would you think that's it is true? today? <laughs> uh, so this base um, is going to be more even in its full note so I'm just playing a C again and there is less of a difference to my ear to the top of the note pa, pa, it's than less, its tail pa, pa, yeah. yes it doesn't go like the Voren Saku kind of like hits in a different way and this almost sounds more even but it is, it is just such a beautiful sound. I love the sound of this bass. It's a great sound of But bass, the whole yeah. thing, yeah, the whole thing sounds more, it sounds more even to me. But, you know, so, I don't know, what do you like better, right? But what you can do, then of course you can mute it. And you get more of a bolt-on yeah. vibe. There's that big transient, oh, oh. more aggressive dying yeah. tail. But it's still just where when you just play a note open, and even with a pick, it presents almost more like a guitar in a weird way. Kinda I don't like know. Like a piano-esque sound to it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was muting it there. I won't mute it. I think Ken Smiths are a really great example of that. You know, um, they've got. Should we do it? Yeah, like no, because actually, I was I wasn't original. I wasn't thinking actually of a of a neck through. I mean, a Ken Smith because these Ken Smiths are actually. Yeah. They're a. Um, 
actually glued in, aren't they? They're glued dovetails. But I do think that they have like a real piano type quality to the sound. Yours, yeah, yours has got jazz based uh, pickups on this one, right? As well. Yeah, mine has single coil. They're the same company that makes, I think, is it, who makes these pickups, Scott? I've got no idea. Oh, Kenneth, is it Ken Kenneth Lawrence? Lawrence? Yeah, Ken Lawrence. Yeah. Ken Lawrence, yeah. Um, so this bass, this bass needs a little bit more. Let's see. Yeah, so just blend it in the middle. <laughs> what a weird sound. It's so cool, though. It's so even, that, dude. It's so even. So clean. Crazy sound, isn't it? Yeah, I was talking to yeah. you the other day. I, I did a, uh, I did a, a live class on my Ken Smith, and I was like listening through. When you have that sound in your cans, it's just pretty crazy. Yeah. Like brutally, um, it's so direct, it's so direct. And if you drop any little note, it like jumps out and like oh. smacks you around the face. And it does. so I used the Ken yeah. Smith, and I just played like crap. And then the day after, I played my like a jazz bass style instrument. It was totally fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, you make some yeah. sort of like farts and so whatever, right? You do, you do some sort of like whatever. You you mess some notes up. Nobody knows. It's fine. But on that Ken yeah. Smith, oh, so brutal. <laughs> it, yeah, it, I feel like too. There is something. I don't know why I feel this way, but a Fender or like a bolt-on style thing does feel more forgiving. Yeah, it's because you get that big rush of initial transient and then kind of that fall-off tail, and it feels like ah, you know, more rhythmic or something, more like a drum. Maybe that's it man yeah maybe it's because you just get the initial and then it's gone mm -hmm. whereas like on something like a smith <laughs> when you play it, it like it stays, it stays forever stays for ages it there and like, ah, <laughs> yeah oh. it's like a house guest that has just overstayed their welcome you're like all right move on you can go now <laughs> <laughs> and you want to hear this neck through oh, yeah do you have a neck through over there what have i got oh i've got a weird a weird glued in actually just to show everybody how wacky this sure. stuff can get. This oh, is yeah. also is glued in. Yeah, this oh is the Man A. Look yeah. at that. How cool. This is, so I'll just show the front of the base. Like, it's obviously outlandishly cool. But, <laughs> yeah. um, Wooden spaceship. Yeah, but this, and this goes really far into the body. But it's still glued. It's still a glued in neck. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, this is kind of, I wouldn't say that this, plays like a usual glued in neck because obviously it looks like a spaceship mm -hmm. but it's still i don't think it has that neck through feel to it even though it's there's a lot of that neck going into the body it's still it's got its own vibe going on but definitely doesn't yeah, doesn't come across does. like a neck through oh it's so cool wow I just love, I mean, I love the craftsmanship of this yeah, stuff. I think yeah. it's so, I think it's just so interesting looking. Here's the old NS2. This was made by Stuart Spector and the team. I think, let's see, 2013. Amazing. And this is a classic design. And it's it's a really good example of it too, because you can really see the neck through the body. Like when you see this base, you're like, yep, there yeah. it is. It has walnut top, or like a Claro walnut top. And then I also believe just a regular, regular walnut, walnut back. Uh, yeah. back. And then they do this beautiful three-piece billet um, maple. So it's this big chunk. And I've been there. I've seen how they do it. I see what they look for in the grain of the billets. I mean, when you order like a U.S. custom shop Spectre, it's so much care and love goes into it. It's re it was really cool to see. And then these wings, the wings of the base, you know, of the different material, uh, actually join into the neck through construction with dowels. Got it. I think, okay. I think that's true. I think there's dowels and glue. So, you know, these wings are glued onto the center block, but there's also some structure, I believe, that goes in. I might I've be wrong about both. that, I've, Will. I've, I've, God, yeah, don't kill me. Right. I've, I've seen it done both ways, and I think that it, it's yeah. fine. Sleep easy, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just spreading misinformation. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes forget that people listen to this podcast. But yeah, like, uh, this is so classic. And this started up in, when When do you know anything about, I mean, sorry to put you on the well, spot. The first but the through. first neck throughs. Oh, my word. Was that, like, maybe a lembe? 
Nick. Oh, or I'll tell you one second. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry that I even asked. I shouldn't have even asked. Nick threw bass, but I feel like it was seventies. <laughs> audio Vox just... was the oh wow Audio Vox sixties maybe. Um, the first electric bass guitar, the solid body Audio Vox 736, created by Paul Tutmark circa 1937, had a neck through construction. Um, let me just see what this looks like. Wait, did you just say 1937? Um, created by T- Paul Tutmark circa 1937. But this, oh, I've heard of this, but this wasn't the first like commercially made, ah. like the first commercially made one was 51 uh fender right <laughs> but yeah see, I, I don't i don't i hate that i even asked this question because yeah i've heard about the the, the paul guy with the bass <laughs> the paul guy that people paul don't dude. really what's his last T- name tupmark tupmark yeah it's actually not easy to to grab that information actually somebody's gonna know and they're gonna be like it's this person um but I just thought I'd show you the vibe. I mean, of the uh, of the classic neck through thing. Now, obviously, EMGs. It's active. It's a whole. It's a whole vibe. Let's see. Wait. Yeah. Also, just crazy. Even. That's really even. Yeah. And less of the nasal thing that the than the Smith yeah. has. But that's less to do with the with the the bolt on his it? It's to do with the circuitry and stuff. The electronics, like that. Yeah, 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 right, right. I mean, gosh, I love the sound of these bases. I really do love the sound of like an EMG PJ configuration like this. And yeah, everywhere you go on this bass. It's got a great bass note. response there. It's like a really it fat does. note, isn't it? I want you to play one of these songs. I want to get Jonathan Marin to play a Spectre. That's Jonathan Marin on a Spectre. That'd be a good day. Oh, it'd be yeah, so cool. That'd be a good it'd day. It'd be so cool. But yeah, every single note up high, even on the E string, they all sound the same. And I remember, like you, Scott, when I was young, I thought, Oh, well, that's better. So I bought a Carvin, <laughs> you know, that was neck yeah, through. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, oh, that means quality. And it 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 is a quality. It is a sign of quality in a sense that they are more difficult to make. But it does not mean that the sound that you're going to get is better. It just means the sound is different, baby. It's a different vibe. Yeah, yeah. What's your, what, what do you gravitate towards? Actually, I know that. It's Bolton, right? Bolt. Bolt. Yeah, for sure. But I but I have this big appreciation. Like I plug in the Spectre and I'm like, oh God, yeah. like this thing is cool. Like I love I love that every note is even no matter where you play it. I love that. It's crazy to me. Um, so sometimes when I play an instrument like this alone, I get this sense of like, oh, this is this is cool. This is better because every note is perfect. Yeah. But then sometimes when I get an instrument like like this or a Ken Smith or you know or a Fodera into a live environment, I I want a bit of that gronk and that the big transient and a, a little bit of a fall off tail and even in recording depending on the recording i mean sometimes the specter is perfect but sometimes i want that classic fender thing that is going to give me that big punchy attack and then a fall off yeah but it's just vibes dude horses it for is courses. horses for courses isn't it like what about well, you yeah me too bolton i think as well yeah and yeah like I've, I'm, I was thinking then, I, you know, that sort of like that raspy sound that I get when I dig in. You can get that sort of like real yes. biting sort of like, it's very easy yes. to get on a jazz bass. Um, yeah, it's kind of when I think about that that particular sound, it's very jazz bass-esque. Uh, yes. I've never had that on a, ball, on a neck through, ever. I know exactly I've what you never mean. Been it's able like to they do don't it. give up. Yeah. They don't go... Bleh. Yeah. Bleh. <laughs> They're kind of like, Bleh. oh... 
yeah, they're, they're sort of like, I can't believe, like, I sort of think of like these personalities that, you know, this is sort of this fine gentleman that, that is like, oh, sir, sir, that is not how you go about playing Yeah, like me. you hit, yeah, like, you hit the string you know, and then it gives you a real freaking like dirty look. It's like, what it's like, are you whoa. doing? Like, yeah, treat me with care. Treat me with care and be gentle, you know, where the jazz bass is like, spank me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I hear you. I think that you can, I mean, obviously you can dig into these things. Like, you know, if I just, just if I turn this guy down know, a little man. bit. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Like, it's sort of still when I'm digging. It's like polite somehow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's just a different vibe, yeah. maybe a different frequency that kind of that bites as well. Slightly different, yeah. isn't it? And here, let's go back home. So again, this is the end of the line in terms of, you know, here we have a neck through presentation of a C note. Big sustain. This one is actually pretty punchy at the top of the note. But that is neck through active electronics, right? The note, this is the classic thing of like the spinal tap thing. The note will last forever. The note is still registering like big signal yeah, on my yeah. meters here. Like there's still all this low end content in the note. The C is still, still moving. I mean, it's wild. So when they talk about sustain, there is something to be said for that around um, a neck through. But let's go back to both. Yeah, do it, do it, do it. Somebody I think about as well when I think about neck through is Anthony Jackson. Like... There's just yes. something about his sound, the evenness, the like, because he's not doing that. He's not sort of like cranking the cranking into the note. He's actually right. He's playing light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's that C on back to the Vorinsaku. Yeah, completely different. Like you hear the. Boom. Th it's almost like Boom. acoustic, like. And then the note, there's a lot of sustain on this bass, yeah. but not in the same way. Like the note is dying now because there's energy loss. You could, I feel this. like I can hear the note in a different way as it, as it sustains. Yeah, it's not the full note. It's like part <laughs> right. of the note is sustaining. <laughs> yeah. You can hear it. Can, yeah. I know. You're not muting that at all. Sorry. There. I guess I was for a minute there. But when I let it sustain, no. Got it. So here yeah, again, I'll yeah. do it one more time. Here's the C, no muting. It starts to fall yeah, away. It starts to fall away, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Can you see that it's on your like meter as well? Cycle yeah. Kind of creep in. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, and it gets a big peak at the top. Boof, poof. Like a kick drum. And then just starts to fall away. And so then, you know, you've got people playing these instruments, like something cool about a lack of sustain. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, Scott, but in the, you know, when I was like, oh, I want a bass to sustain forever. I want all the evenness. I want every yeah, single man, thing. Yeah, I did that too. But the, <laughs> yeah, the thing about a bolt or the thing about something that doesn't sustain as well is that then you have to rearticulate. And there's something kind of cool about a bass that sounds more like this. Now I'm muting here a little bit, but, but there's this vibe of like, you need to play because when you just play the one note, it goes away. Yeah. I think it's <laughs> so it overrated almost, as well, man. Like, yeah, I agree. But I, I'm with you. Like, I that's agree. what I did when I was like younger. I was like, oh, it's gonna, you know, I'd go into a bass shop or like play a friend's bass. I'd be like. Bow. And then I'd be like, listening to it sustain. Oh, I'm like, oh yeah, it's going yeah. great to sustain, tap, right? Yes. And reality is like, when Go do you ever bite, hold it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, when do you ever <laughs> hold a note on for more than like two bars? You know I mean? <laughs> Bow. Yeah, very like, rarely. You know, right. Like, just, yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and there, yeah, there's something about like Paul McCartney, you know, with a Hofner, and that's that's I believe that's a set neck construction, but it's hollow and short scale. So you know, those basses have a very short, plunky note production, yeah. and 
I have this idea that part of the reason Paul sounded like he did is because his bass didn't sustain, you know? Yeah. You just have to work with the thing you have. Like, I'm not ever going to expect this Vorinsaku bass to sound like the Spectre. Never. You know, I would play something different on it. I would take a pick and be plunky on it. Yeah. You know, like, it it gives me that kind of vibe. I wouldn't play that same bass line on a Spectre. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it is a lovely, wonderful, complex world, and I feel... Freaking love it, dude. <laughs> when I, I love when I was it. talking about that, when I was talking about the, uh, you might not want to hear this, the sustain thing. I love it too, man. Oh, the, there's yeah. one, there's one case where you might want sustain more than like a regular bass. Yeah. We're just. Fretless. Yeah. Gosh, that sounds good. Wow, dude. That is lovely. You know, like maybe on a fretless, you'd want that note to bloom yeah. in a different way. Saying that, I think fretless is just a completely different conversation. And well, this might need to be a new episode. Yeah, but I, here's, the, here's the deal, though, man. <laughs> yeah. Here's the deal. Yeah. I don't know enough about it to really be able to speak about mm. it. Like, I really, like what yeah. I do know is that I've played some fretlesses and... Okay, so I'll say this. So I've played some fretlesses that just, when you play them, they just... Like the note blooms in a completely different way oh. to other fretlesses. Yes. Like you play that yes. low. This this bass hasn't got it actually. That one sounds a little more fretted it's down blah, blah, blah. low. Yeah, where it's not got this. Mm. Wah, you know that thing yeah. that some fretlesses that have. Wide. Yeah. Wah. You know, when I was at Spectre talking to, I was talking to them about a fretless build and Will DeYoung, because I was talking about what I wanted. And I, you know, I've mentioned on last, you know, on a podcast a number ago that I sold this fretless that I really regret. It was a Zahn and it had that, <laughs> this like <laughs> synthy, incredible envelope. And he said that part of that's about construction um, and, you know, material, yeah. but part of it's about action. Right. Got like it. that the yeah. action makes a huge like when you have that real fine line between too low of action and it's buzzing just slightly yeah, yeah. That that's the thing like you play blah, and as the string is vibrating it's like the initial it's attack vibrating isn't, against the actual board yes so it's against like, the fingerboard yeah it's, it's giving this it's, it's rattling yeah. it, essentially like a sitar yeah you yeah. know and that when you get the action in a place like high action fretless doesn't moi in the same way. It doesn't have that long, like build up of yeah, low yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah, it kind of goes, yeah, pum. yeah, it goes po versus low action, low strings on a fretless because they're buzzing a little. And yeah, he, he was, he got really geeky about it and it was amazing. And I hope we do, I hope we do this build, but it's, uh, you know, he was like, oh, the wood combo neck through with low action will give you just like synthy envelopey sustain. And I was like, oh my uh, God, it's like a dream. I know, yeah. <laughs> I, I will also say as well that some fretless basses are easier to play in tune than, than others. Um, mm. Or more forgiving so mm. th this fretless actually is not very forgiving at all it's got mm. the bridge pickup down here so when you play it gosh it sounds so good though but you just sound really nice playing it I've, also yeah, like i've just played a ton of fretlesses uh yeah. i think that yeah, so this one isn't very forgiving, whereas I've played other ones where it, it's just sort of like so much easier to get like a, yeah, to, to feel like you're playing it in tune. And I think what the difference is, it's like, do you know when we're talking about the Ken Smith and the sound, mm. the tone of that note is so, yes. th there's so much mid-presence in the note that you just yes. cannot... Yes. 
if you if you do anything wrong, it's just going to jump out and slap you in the face. It's like super unforgiving. <laughs> yeah, right. I think the same thing with fretless yes. is like some have got more. Yeah, some if you if you're a little bit out of tune, you're going to really hear it. Some of them, it's not mm. going to be as obvious. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Like, I think that this, even though it's less forgiving as a fretless, might be there might be a bonus in that because when you're playing it, you can really hear whether it's in or out in terms of, you know, your your tuning. Whereas on something else, it might be a little bit more forgiving, but with that, it's a little harder to hear whether you're bang on in tune or not. And also just to put out there as well that, you know, I think with fretless, you can play out a tune a little bit. I was listening to, and it doesn't sound <laughs> bad, you know. I was listening to something that Hadrian Ferro play yesterday was playing yesterday, um, and he was playing a F bass fretless on it, and it was there was little bits of it that were slightly flat, and I was like, I don't think that takes away from it at all. It just sounded amazing. Hmm, yeah, it didn't sure. sort of like offend yeah. me at all. I wasn't like, oh, this is horrible. Yeah, yeah. I think there is some sort of like, there's a bit of forgiveness too, like around upright playing too, you know, like you hear jazz, uh, like you, you, even the greats yeah. were never always no. in tune. I mean, intonation is always uh, a fight, yeah. Yeah. always. And there's something kind of beautiful about the struggle of playing a note and then adjusting the note on a fretless because it's just constant adjustment. Yeah. You're never, like, I feel like on a fretless, I never anyway play a note and I'm like, oh, they're perfect. <laughs> it's like, I'm always like, oh, is it a little, and then I'm kind of vibrating vibrato and i'm trying to find the center yeah, yeah you know we're like the pitch center but there is a bit of like yeah it's never empirically correct so you kind of are always it, actually to me it's almost exhausting to play fretless because i i feel like i'm thinking about intonation just constantly like i'm i'm self evaluating uh, you know like, i'm asking myself, yeah, yeah, yes yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. exactly i'm evaluating every single note i play i'm like ooh, was that in you know and like it keeps me really engaged but it's also Wears like you out as well ooh, like you're never like yep that's a c you know you're never <laughs> you're never like perfect yeah <laughs> you know it's just like no it's always a little <sighs> a little funky yeah we should do we should actually do a uh we Let's should do, do a, a fretless, fretless episode. episode that'd be a blast actually I do. Let's do you know do what? I, t- yeah. I still toy with the idea about just going fretless, Look, like as a thing. <laughs> you know, like a few months ago, we were like, this is like- I, "We're just going to play slap bass." What kind of what kind of musician? <laughs> I'm, I'm a slap bass player. Oh, a bass player? No, <laughs> oh, a slap dude. bass. All I play is slap. <laughs> no. no. Whereas, like, yeah, oh, I'm God. thinking about it. I'm there's something I'm really <laughs> love loving about fretless it. at the minute, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Lean in, baby. Lean in. Now it's the hunt for Excalibur fretted and Excalibur yeah. fretless. The thing <laughs> that I love about fretted that I will say is that I d- you can't get that, what we were talking about earlier, actually, when we when you're playing that jazz bass or bolt-on style instrument, you dig in and that note l- get, gives you that sort of like real, like, yeah, you know, that kind of, let me just, yep. I'll just grab this, let me just grab this jazz bass because it's, it's so good at it. Do you have the Aleva? Yeah. Oh, hang on. There yeah, there is something about note presentation on a classic Fender instrument that is intoxicating. It's like when you smack it. Is that the Oliva? It is. It is. So, you yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, like that. I'm sorry. I know that the volume is probably that. really low. No, no, no. I actually hear okay, it okay. Yeah, the... try, try again. Yeah. I like, I love her. Yeah, smack. And you are right, dude. Bolts. Yeah, like, I've never got that. Bolts yeah, I've never that. had that tone on a on an X2, ever. Right. On, or on a fretless... Or on a Gibson yeah, set neck. Yeah, none of that, yeah. Or on a, yeah, right, none of that. It's like a Fender-style bolt-on thing. And this is why, Scott, this is why everybody needs 40. <laughs> Damn right. Huh? Damn right. Oh, 
Because you got to have one of those that's got fresh steel strings. You got to have one that's got half dead nickels. You got to have one of those that's got uh, flats on it. You got to have, you know what I'm saying? You got to have one for a different tuning. You got to have one that's yeah, your favorite color. Absolute, Come on, absolutely, absolutely, man. But oh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, but I don't think Very I could cool, lose man. this. No, because that also sounds like you. I mean, you were doing that on P bases years ago like that sounds like you and i don't play that way at all i can kind of fake it but i don't feel yeah 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 yeah, yeah. oh it's such a cool vibe man that's just not required of me very often like you know you'll never play on somebody's record and do that let me see if i I play that on the fretless you'll hear that it just doesn't translate at all yeah 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 do it see guys you should be going to get the uh Getting on the YouTube channel if you're not on it already. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, get on that YouTube channel. It's it's sort of it like, it's it saying just, to you, yeah. no, no, it's saying to it you, no thank you. It. No thank you. It's like, lighter approach, please. <laughs> That's a cool vibe, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The slidey harmonic. Let's see. Now, this thing is plugged in. <laughs> but let me see if this can do it, too. So, bolty. Is that a bolt? Yeah. It's a short scale, so it's a different vibe. But, I mean, it gives up yeah. that spank. Yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, it's cool. It's just a different, you know, different thing to like that fender, that active it's kind diff- of like it's fender got a different sound. Frequency. But, the, the 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 bite that yeah. bark is a different frequency. That's more mid. Yes. Whereas like, the, the the yes jazz bass there was more kind of scooped. Uh, yeah, Butman has yes, got like yeah. a scoop, and it, and when you so when it bites, you've got like a lot of high and a lot of low, rather than yeah, that, that yeah, mid yeah, frequency. Yeah. Oh god! Yeah, damn. just bathing cool. in bass at the minute. This is awesome, <laughs> dude. This was fun. This was fun. Jeez, oh, listen to that. Oh, dude, check this out. <laughs> Sorry, shall I just play? I'll play you this. Tell me what the and then play me. Uh, let's play him out. Let's play. I'll play, play you us out, out, Scott. This to is this track out? that I've been. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll do it live. All right, we'll do a lot. I, I might, I Bill might, com- Riley, you know that no. bit. I might completely mess oh, this up. Oh, hang on, no, I'll hang do on. it. You got it. Um, Like that, you can't do that on a fretted. Hell yeah, you can't do dude. it on a fretted. No, you cannot. That's a vibe, man. I mean, that is like a that is a thumbprint sound. Wow, dude, that's lovely. That's lovely. That's gonna this be so what, fun. This I wish I could be there me too, man. Just wanna, this is yeah. I just want to make the coffee for you guys and hang, oh, man. Maybe we can do oh, something. Very man. cool. Like it'd be great if you could come over. Just, oh, I know. See you in a month, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word oh my god anyhow man. should we call him? um hey yeah. this was fun let's do let's do uh something on fretless yeah it would be really cool because i've got it you know that i have a bb an 80s bb what's fretless. it like what's it sound like have Fucking you got it in awesome there? plug it in yeah it's gonna wave no way dude that's <laughs> next episode <laughs> 
Oh, bring it on. Bring it on. Okay, fruitless episode coming up. Okay, guys. Um, hopefully, if you've been listening to this, you'll go check out the YouTube uh, the uh, the YouTube podcast that we've got on it's called Scott's Bass Lessons um, podcast on YouTube. Go subscribe on there, and you can check out all of the video podcasts. And uh, yeah, and if you want to come and learn from Ian as well, he- we will help you become better bass players and inspire you. We sure will uh, to pick up your bass more and and inspire you to misbehave and buy more basses as well. If you want to do that, come over to scottsbasslessons.com, yeah. yeah. grab a free trial, and give it a test drive. And listen, if you're checking out this pod on YouTube, leave us a comment. Um, If you're checking it out anywhere else, uh, please also leave us a review. Give us that five-star rating. If you're on YouTube, shoot us a comment. Let us know what you want to hear. Uh, If there's a piece of gear, if there's a topic you want to talk about, I go through and I read these comments. So we are trying to give you guys what you want. So far, you've told us that you want gear. We have seen that very clearly. But if there's something else, too, that you are clamoring to hear about, we got you. We will always... Try to provide what you want. Absolutely. Cool, guys. Okay, let's call it. See you in a bit, dudes. Bye. Cheers, everybody.